this week we're talking about SpaceX on Red Alert. The Raptor engine is costing way too much. We've got some Elon Musk emails about the problem. Rocket Lab reveals Neutron and Blue Origins. Orbital Reef gets funding from NASA. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Today in Space. I am your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex Giafanos, and we're recording here on December 8th, 2021. And this episode is going to be about the balance. And right now, SpaceX is in the middle of a very pivotal point in their history at this point in affecting the space industry. Starship's engine, the Raptor engine, is turning out to cost way more than obviously a company would need it to be, especially in SpaceX's case where they have to fly one Starship every two weeks. So there were Elon Musk emails that Space Explored originally uh, released, and they show his response warning his company that bankruptcy is possible. So we're going to dive into that. So while SpaceX is basically building the thing that NASA just chose as part of the Artemis program and the human landings uh, contract, the human landing system that they're going to use to send the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon, Starship is turning out to be super expensive. So there's obviously a lot of drama around that. Um, but in general, SpaceX is kind of being attacked from all sides right now. Uh, but it's in the interest of progress in space. You know, SpaceX has really ripped through the industry. You know, for anyone that's new to this podcast, I was going to school for aerospace engineering from 2008 to 2015. And in that time, I was following along basically what my career could have been. And it was such a unique time in the industry where SpaceX wasn't even a thought. They were, they were like a, a baby of the industry. I was just, we just started a Substack, so todayinspace.substack.com. If, you know, we, we wanted to create a newsletter for a really long time, but we were trying to figure out, like, I don't want to just send you guys spam that doesn't mean anything. And we found out uh, through one of my friends, Mike Sullivan, who is one of the co creators of Snapcaller. We helped them design their their product uh, in the early stages uh, with our AG3D printing lab. Uh, but anyways, Mike, uh, who's a longtime friend, recommended it, and I'm actually really enjoying it. So basically every episode that we're going to have is going to come out on Substack. We're going to dive deeper into some of these episodes, uh, and I'm actually going to do a little bit of writing, we may even like speak over it. it it's a cool format, uh, and, and it's a, a way to kind of build a community, and that's the little things we're going to start doing in 2022. Substack is one of them. So go follow us there. It's free for right now. Uh, it's diving deeper into what you're listening to already, right? So go subscribe to us there. Uh, before we dive more into this episode, it's obviously going to be Starship. Uh, There's going to be, we're talking about Rocket Lab and Blue Origins Orbital Reef. We're going to tie all that together. But follow us uh, wherever you subscribe on podcast. Subscribe, share with friends. Uh, obviously, social media, follow us there. So for this episode, we just were talking about how SpaceX is being attacked kind of from all sides, right? So, uh, and, and in part of this, this is part of the private industry. This is part of the balance of contractors now really designing full missions, not just, you know, certain vehicles. In SpaceX's case, they're, they're so well equipped that they may end up going to Mars if NASA can't figure out how. And in now, at this point, with how many contracts they have, they're going to be doing it together now. So this this new space industry balance, SpaceX has kind of taken the throne of the, the big NASA contract for the next big project. Uh, but right behind them is Blue Origin. And we had talked about in a previous episode that Orbital Reef kind of appeared right before the HLS contract debacle ended. And it's a great idea. It's a commercial space station. You can go check that episode out. Uh, if you go back to, I believe it's episode 259, um, we talked about the emergence of Orbital Reef, and uh, NASA chose them as one of the companies involved. I think Nanorax is a part of that. There's a few others as well, but uh, they are getting invested in NASA, just like the human landing system contract that Na that SpaceX just won. Uh, there were three companies, Dynetics, Blue Origin, the national team, and uh, SpaceX and their Starship. And now Blue Origin is going to get an injection of money to develop Orbital Reef, which they want to get a commercial space station into orbit by the end of the decade, so by 2030. And 
have that be a place where people can conduct business, research, you know, a lot of materials research, uh, drug development. There's a lot of really interesting <clears throat> things, never not, never mind uh, actual uh, movies that could be filmed in space. I know we've got potentially, oh, what's his name? Oh, Tom Cruise. Um, apparently, he's already has, I think, with Axiom Space, there's been hints that he's going to be doing that anyways and i think there's already a russian team on the international space station that was doing that and may still be doing that but um orbital reef is huge they got chosen so they they are in the progress of nasa picking them for this next step because if we're going to go back into space why are we what are we doing there once we're there and having space stations are going to help tremendously and it's going to be really good i mean these space stations could end up becoming the big spacecraft that we travel in you know it may not be a uh, a Star Trek S spacecraft. It may be like this whole structure of these uh, different things that we fly around. And hey, if they get that to work, that's great. Um, but Orbital Reef successfully chosen. We'll have a link if you want to dive deeper into that topic. Uh, but Blue Origin is in the race and developing something that SpaceX doesn't necessarily have. But SpaceX's Crew Dragon and SpaceX's uh, Starship are going to be designed to hook up with NASA hardware, which ultimately. Orbital Reef and all these other space stations will develop the same hardware, which means at some point, uh, assuming one of these space stations, let's just say Orbital Reef is successful, SpaceX is going to integrate with Blue Origin and there's going to be a sharing of information. That could be another fracture point <laughs> or another drama-ridden uh, thing at some point, but it is, it is interesting that uh, it was a great chess move, I think, by Blue Origin. Uh, in the space industry. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then Rocket Lab released their new rocket that can take, I believe it's 8,000 kilograms. I'm going to double check that real quick. Yes, 8,000 kilograms into orbit. It's going to compete with the Falcon 9. And I really love the design choice. You know, there's, there is a beauty. I think uh, if you follow Lex Friedman at all, he talks about like kind of this beauty in science and simplicity. I think he's been talking a lot with people about string theory and, and, and extreme ideas like that. And designing rockets, like what SpaceX has done, I can tell you as someone who's being taught by the experts in the field, or at least the professors of, uh, you know, of these institutions that are just they're private institutions and they literally only train people like this this whole school was that i went to was entirely engineers there wasn't any other program that wasn't engineering uh in in some sense basically an entire stem school and when you see th back then it was not part of reality that reusable rockets could happen uh, there, there was no belief in it, and I was watching SpaceX succeed in this area. And what's really cool is the competition that Rocket ha Rocket Lab has with uh, SpaceX. This is Neutron, is a launcher. They're calling it the Mega Constellation Launcher, uh, that is going to allow them to take part of this, you know, small payload CubeSat type missions into orbit. The, these multiple service missions, which is going to bring in a lot of money to develop their next thing. And their rocket has a has a base, has a rigid stand on the bottom, so legs that are fixed at the bottom. But it's that whole thing is the first stage, right? So you have a similar shape to this. You have um, the engines at the top. And up here, there are four fairings that open up like a flower. And when that gets to orbit, the second stage is inside that, and it just spits out like <laughs> like reverse pac-man and then launches and it solves one of the problems of reusability which spacex has still yet to fully uh implement or at least make it uh, cost effective in in the reusability are the the fairing recoveries they fly off they're one of the only parts of the rocket left that i mean other than this the the deep stage the second stage that spacex isn't fully recoverable yet uh, and they're expensive. Fairings are super expensive. And the, the fairings just open up and close again. Then now you're only recovering one piece of hardware, roughly. One one vehicle instead of multiple pieces uh, requiring a giant fleet, which has been done, is, is being done. Uh, there's been so many uh, amazing advances in that kind of thing, like sea recovery of... Of rockets and and now crew and if you've seen any of the crew missions the inspiration 4 mission with recovering the, the crew dragon coming back from from earth coming back from 
their time in orbit like it's there's a lot that goes into it so if you're talking about the ultimate business plan like if you know if rocket lab is able to provide the same kind of launch service which is basically just tossing something something into orbit uh we we want that to be competitive because that's going to drive the prices down that's what made spacex re like ignite the industry um into thinking about reusability it, at a full at a full level you know post space shuttle retirement the reusability was just like i can't i'm, I'm triggered man I, like i can't listen <laughs> i can't listen to you talking about reusability and so rocket lab coming in with this is going to be huge they've had a rough patch the last few years but they've had a few launches that have definitely have not delivered stuff to orbit and it's been difficult but launching rockets is difficult especially when you're creating your own design for it um and trying to push the bounds and it's not like spacex who's successful now has not come across their problems and that's part of what this episode is kind of uh, around is is spacex being honest through elon musk about what they need to work on in order for this to work and what we'll talk about in a second here is just how often he seems to do that so let's move on to our next section talking about the starship right so starship their new rocket their ability to send tons of kilograms into into orbit i think that's a weird phrase but many kilograms into orbit more than we're able to now that that changes our ability of what we can send into space right Launching into space is about mass. How much mass can you get out of orbit? It would be great to one day have 3D printers in orbit that are manufacturing giant spaceships and any kind of density and strength that we want, but that's not here yet. And so we've got to get it out of our gravitational well on Earth and into space, and that costs money. And for a while there, we didn't even own a rocket that really was going to allow us to build anything useful in space the space shuttle let us build hubble let us build the space station and imagine what we could do with something that could lift even more into space and send humans to the moon and to mars and potentially anywhere else in the solar system that's within reach this is this is a really giant thing they're trying to do and there's a reason why nobody's done it and we in our notes for this week we literally had a starship belly flopping in (laughs) <laughs> and money basically belly flopping through money on its way down because it's the raptor engine that is at the core of the problem for spacex right now so if we go to space explored our friends over there derek wise is the is the author here on this article elon musk says spacex could face genuine risk of bankruptcy from starship engine production i want to focus more on why i think what I think about Elon Musk's move about addressing this, because he knows that someone's going to leak his email. It's happened before. So I'm sure he chose his words very specifically. But this article by Derek is extremely well put together. Um, I used it as a focal point. There was some of the stuff I was going to talk about that he already laid out perfectly. So I'm pointing you to that article. But what I'm going to read is the full email from article and then uh, from Elon. And I will point you to his link in this week's episode the spacex raptor crisis so the full email from elon to spacex employees he said unfortunately raptor production crisis is much worse than it had seemed a few weeks ago as we have dug into the issues following the exiting of prior senior management which there have been a lot of vps that got let uh that left um a lot of changing of the guard also a lot of people retiring i think spacex i've heard uh, through LinkedIn posts and other people, you know, hearing that it's in a transition phase. It's not really the startup company SpaceX anymore. Now it's the big, big NASA contract, NASA human landing system contract SpaceX that also launches regularly more than any other launch company out there, um, providing prices that uh, are competitive to sending things into orbit. And they they also have the starlink service which we found out uh in a lot of this research that they're actually losing uh, in that first round thousand dollars per uh per person that bought originally because it just costs that much um in launching it up and having raptor having the raptor engine and starship is what helps spacex build all the other aspects of their company including getting to mars 
Um, never mind making sure that the NASA astronauts land on the moon safely and can return and sending uh, Yusaku Maezawa, um, who is now on the International Space Station, who flew on a Soyuz rocket to train to be prepared to take his crew around the moon. So there's, it's, it's this crisis has been framed in a in a really, I mean, obviously political or like I hate Elon or, or whatever the issue is. Oh boy. Sorry about that. Set alarms. Uh, okay. Uh, so back to what we were talking about. Uh, SpaceX is in a lot of stuff. It's not like Raptor is... Well, you know what? Let me finish. <laughs> this is what happens when I talk about space. I go on rants. So I'm going to finish reading this, and then we'll go into it. But I apologize. My my Greekness uh, is, is strong with the Force, especially with uh, segues and tangents. Okay. Elon says, I was going to take this weekend off as my first weekend off in a long time, but instead I will be on the Raptor line all night and through the weekend. Unless you have critical family matters or cannot physically return to Hawthorne, we will need all hands on deck to recover from what is, quite frankly, a disaster. Con- the consequences for SpaceX, if we cannot get enough reliable Raptors made, is that we then can't fly Starship, which means We then can't fly Starlink Satellite V2. This is what I was talking about earlier. should just let Elon say it. Falcon has neither the volume nor the mass to orbit needed for Satellite V2. Satellite V1 by itself is financially weak, while V2 is strong. In addition, we are spooling up terminal production for several several million units per year, which will consume massive capital, assuming that satellite V2 will be on orbit to handle the bandwidth demand. These terminals will otherwise be, will will be useless otherwise. What it comes down to is that we face a genuine risk of bankruptcy if we don't achieve, if we can't achieve a Starship flight rate of at least once every two weeks next year. Thanks, Elon. So, what you hear from that is what we noted as typical Elon. Uh, which is that he's very straightforward about a lot of these issues, especially when he probably knows that it's going to be leaked or, or told outside. He's he's very often, you know, kind of the antithesis of the kind of NASA thing where it's like, you know, shut the comms, shut the doors, no one leaves when something bad happens. Uh, while there is that level with Elon, he is extremely open in comparison to pretty much every other space technology company out there that I can think of to, to his level so he'll reveal stuff on Twitter he'll he'll get his emails leaked and basically you know he he sunk all his money in the beginning to even get that one final launch for the Falcon 1 so that then they could get the next contract to build the Falcon 9 eventually and he he basically if that had failed on that last try we wouldn't be talking about Elon probably right um, there's, a, there's a there's a potential of that, but he's also recently uh, sold some stock, some Tesla stock. I think he even asked about you know something about gains tax. I don't know. Regardless, he now has some extra cash. He might be preparing for the fact that if they fail, he's going to have to inject some money into this to make this work. But obviously, they're just being very honest about where they are. They seem to have reached a point where. You know, they figured out the problem. They're now moving on to solving that. And, you know, Elon, I think he pulled up like a, I remember seeing he pulled up like a mini house that he sleeps in next to the the Starship base, Starbase. And uh, he also has been known to sleep on the manufacturing floor. So this is him warning everybody in the company that he's made a calculation. He's now positioned the company in a place where they're going to go after this and in order for all of these big plans they're going to make SpaceX successful and then able to do more if this thing which is this engine which is probably going to blow up most likely going to blow up a few times they know that's going to happen the cost of making that and making it so that it's really good and and as he says reliable they need to be able to fly once every two weeks I mean, these things at some point, very soon after the first testing, uh, like SN, I believe it's SN20, like it's 
going to be dumped into into the sea. It's not going to fly again. Um, so that's a whole bunch of Raptor engines that aren't going to work. Um, and they're also going to test that first stage. So that's a whole bunch of Raptor engines that just go into the air. Is This is why space progress has taken so long is because it's so expensive. And if they can't get those engines again, then... There's no reusability with Starship. There's, you, you, you aren't able to sink enough money into the development to get to a point where now you've learned how to successfully land all the time, and then the moon should be easier, and so should Mars, because technically you know, the gravity is easier. It's probably a different approach, but regardless, the Raptor engine, taming the Raptor engine is SpaceX's need right now. And while that is their major focus, they've got Rocket Lab that's very close behind their heels, um, competing with their Falcon 9, which if they don't get the Raptor engine situation fixed out, fixed up, then that will become a major issue. Uh, and Orbital Reef taking over a lot of the commercial aspects going into space, it's very likely that some of SpaceX's money may be going into Orbital Reef's pockets because of what's needed for the next, the next stage. So there is uh, a lot of really good stuff. It's competition for them. It's stress for them. But it's very, very exciting stuff. And it's progress. And, you know, the new tech development from Rocket Labs, Neutron with the fairings that don't uh, disappear um, and they stay on. You don't have to recover them as well. Orbital Reef getting chosen almost instantaneously after this, this legal battle um, is huge, huge progress. And, you know, we do have faith in what, SpaceX is doing down in Boca Chica. They've they have landed them a few times. We've we've seen them do this with the Falcon 9 before. Um, I think it's just a warning that with the way things are, and this should be an obvious statement for anyone living through these times. 2021 hasn't been a great year, and we have no idea what 2022 uh, is coming up with in the future here. So I think it makes complete sense that he wanted to to warn everybody about this. So thank you, Derek, for being a great reporter and, and pulling all of that stuff. Please go check out this article. It's from November 29th. Fantastic article about this whole scenario. There's so much there. So thank you, Space Explored, for putting out that great article. And that closes it out for this week for us, everybody. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter on Substack, today in space substack.com. Subscribe to us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And, of course, our YouTube page. Like videos, share them. You know, all, all, the, all the stuff I apparently have to say. Maybe, maybe this will help. <laughs> But thank you so much for joining us uh, on Today in Space. Make sure to look out on our Twitter page. We got Gary V's new book, 12 and a Half, which, you know, Gary V has been huge in, in helping us promote the podcast. Part of the reason why you're probably, if you're new to this podcast within the last year, part of that is from the stuff I've been learning from him about building a brand and marketing. And, you know, as a, as a science communicator, I, I think it's really important to learn those skills um, and if you combine if you can combine that with the complex stuff that we have around us, and then somehow frame a story as to why all this complex stuff matters for humanity and all this stuff, then I think that's the way to go. And so, if you're a science communicator or even just someone who's wants to make their own way in science uh, or or anything STEM or arts related, any, really anything. If you guys are into building a business, you know, we have our 3D printing lab, AG 3D printing, um, where, you know, we help bring people's ideas into reality, not not just our own. We do plenty of that over at AG 3D printing on Instagram. But yeah, like it's it's been a really amazing experience to see the community that he's building there. And I'd like to share some of that love. I had, I bought a whole bunch of books, so I have a few to give away. So if you're interested, please let me know. We'll, we'll ship it out to you if you're in the U.S. If you're out of the country, you know, obviously let us know if you're still interested. I don't, we'll, we'll see what we can do, but pretty much U.S. only, but reach out to us. It's been very helpful for me, and I've, I've met a ton of really cool people through that, and I'd like to pass that on to you uh, for the holidays. So we are going to have maybe another interview this week, but basically we're closing it out for the holidays here towards the end of the year. We will have uh, episodes pretty much every week, and we'll close out the month on Substack, reviewing everything that we've talked about in this last month and kind of the stuff we would point you to as the month developed. What's caught on? What's what's the thing to look for? Um, obviously, Starship flying here in this next year is going to be huge. We've got NS-19 launching for Blue Origin. This is 
tomorrow, Thursday, December 9th, I think they're going to attempt. It might have gotten pushed out for weather reasons, uh, but we wish them luck. I know Michael Strahan's on there. It's going to be a cool mission to watch. Same thing that uh, William Shatner did going up in New Shepard Capsule, doing a parabola, enjoying weightlessness, weightlessness, seeing the curvature of the Earth, and then coming back down safely. That's That's their mission. We wish them luck. And we've got the James Webb Space Telescope mission coming up around Christmas. So look out for that. We'll be following here on Today in Space. Thank you for joining us. And as always, spread love and spread science. See you next time.